leads us into victory. He's torn apart the sea for us. We serve a good God and a God who is unchanging, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So would you just continue to sing that with me? As we sing this together, I'm calling on the God of Jacob. I'm calling on the God of Jacob.
morning. We're going to start doing a new song this morning. Um, and the chorus goes a little bit like this. I've witnessed your faithfulness And I've seen you breathe life within So I'll pour out my praise again You're worthy, God, you're worthy So I pour out my praise again. You're worthy, God, you're worthy of all of it. Come on, let's sing it together one more time.
we go into the service this morning, I pray that our hearts are opened and that you move. Lord, we thank you that you are so good and that you love us. You guys may be seated. Amen. Good morning. Can we just give praise to the Lord one more time? Amen. Come on. Praise the Lord for his goodness and his faithfulness. I love that last song, Your Presence is Where I Found Home. I'm encouraged in John 15, 5. And I want to remind you this morning of this truth. If you remain in me, the Lord says, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen? And I think when we're in uh, this season of the rhythms and the stress, maybe in the, the grind of academic work and work and all, of, all that life brings us, uh, sometimes we can be tempted to try to do things on our own. Am I the only one? Or can we relate to that? We, we are tempted to sometimes uh, try to do things on our own. And I want to encourage you this morning from John 15, 5, to remain in him, to abide in him and his word. Amen? Amen. Hey, and I'm encouraged in this as we think about uh, growing and, and, and the invitation that the Lord gives us to remain in him, to abide in him, um, to, not, to not do it alone, that we would continue to lean on each other, to lean on our communities of growth, that we would be in God's word, not just alone, but together with others. And one of the things that we do here at CBU, you've heard about SL Night, we're going to be meeting again tomorrow night, and uh, we're just going to be looking at what, it, what does it look like to, to grow as a disciple of Jesus and do that not alone but together? What does it look like to remain with the Lord and abide with Him and be with Him and grow with others? I want to invite you uh, to grow together with us tomorrow night. We have space for you to grow with us. I want you to I want to just invite you to come to be a part of that and to learn together with us. And so that's tomorrow night, SL night at 8 p.m. Um, tell your neighbor, don't, don't forget, there's an online chapel due tonight, public service announcement. So if you didn't do that yet, there is an online chapel that's due tonight. We want you to pass, uh, pass chapel. Hey, the last thing I want to just remind you of is this, is that tomorrow night is the deadline for summer service project application. So many of you have applied for USP or ISP or, or GenSend or a summer opportunity. Um, man, I was so challenged thinking even about um, Claude's sermon a few weeks ago when he talked about, man, how important these next few years are. But then he said, actually, uh, man, the next few summers are so important to your journey and, and where God is moving you. So I encourage you just to think about how will you spend your summer? So think about that. If that's something that the Lord has put on your heart, and I think maybe, maybe you haven't taken that step to just do that sort of interest application, um, maybe he's moving you to do that before tomorrow night, before the deadline. Hey, I'm honored to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, my wife this morning asked me, hey, who's speaking in chapel? I said, Kelly Minter. And she said, oh, I have one of her books. I, I just finished one of her books. It was really encouraging. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Uh, she is an author. She's written many books. She's a passionate Bible teacher. Uh, she's a podcaster. Man, she works closely with Justice and Mercy International. We are uh, just privileged and honored to have Kelly Minter speaking with us this morning. Would you give her a warm CBU welcome? Well, hey, you guys, it's so good to be here with you this morning. I, this was a wonderful excuse for me to get out of Nashville, Tennessee and get to California. So yes, thank you. There's like two of you that are super excited about that this morning. But um, yeah, so I, I, when I, when this popped up as a possibility to come out here, I was really excited because I am so passionate and so excited about the exact stage of life that you guys are in right now. And you have your future ahead of you. There's so many opportunities, so many exciting things that lay before you. And the decisions that you make right now and the choices that you make right now are gonna define much of your future. And so I, today as I was thinking about, praying about what message I wanted to bring you, I thought I'm gonna bring you a message from, um, boy, probably 20 some years ago. And I hate to say this, but even 20 years ago, I was still older than all of you. Very sad moment for me right now. But I was 20, about 20 years ago, I was at least closer to your age, and I was sitting um, on a couch at my friend's house, 
And I had been in Nashville just a few years, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but I had moved from Washington, D.C. area in Virginia to Nashville to, and signed a record deal and uh, was in Christian music, a singer-songwriter, and um, I was going to be rich and famous all for the glory of God. I don't know if anybody has those intentions. Um, okay, there's a few of you that chuckled. That's good. That was a joke. Um, but I did come to Nashville feeling like, oh my gosh, the Lord is going to, I'm going to serve him, but then he's going to give me everything I want and he's going to exalt me. And as I was sitting in my uh, couch of my friend's living room, I was sitting in the middle of a lot of broken dreams. It had been a few years after I'd gotten to Nashville, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But the Lord led me to a passage in John chapter 2. And so if you have your Bibles today and you want to follow along, I'm just going to read the first 11 verses of John chapter 2, and I want to walk you through what the Holy Spirit did in my life in that moment, because I know that a lot of you... In fact, not a lot of you. I know that every single one of you in this room has dreams. You have dreams. You have things that you want to accomplish for the Lord. You have things that you want to accomplish for yourself. Um, you have things you want to accomplish for others. And you have big dreams, and this is a good time to have dreams. But for me in that moment, I was sitting in a pile of broken dreams. And the Lord led me to John chapter 2. And verse uh, one, it says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. What does that have to do with you and me, woman, Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first, and then after people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Father God, we thank you that you are present with us this morning. Father, I pray for every need, for every question, Lord, for every ache, for every burden, that is represented in this room, and we thank you, God, that you are here, present among us to meet our needs, um, to answer the cries of our heart, and to direct our paths. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So here's the thing, there's this wedding that Jesus is invited to, and I don't know if you noticed it, but it says that Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited as well. And I want you to see just right off the very top of verse 2 that when we are followers of Jesus, we get invited to what the places he gets invited to. So where Jesus is invited, we get invited. And that is why the disciples were there. They're, They're following Jesus. They're at this wedding, and perhaps they knew the bride or the bridegroom. And the problem was is that wine had run out. So clearly this wedding did not take place at probably California Baptist University, but the wine had run out, and uh, this was a big deal in Jewish culture because the, there was a year, or a, there was, sorry, not a year, but like a week or two long festivity for uh, people who were getting married. This was huge. And so they would throw out these long, long parties, and people would celebrate and rejoice. And if your party ran out of wine, it was a huge disgrace to you. And so Mary is very concerned that the parties were out of wine, and so she goes to Jesus to fix this. She says, this party's run out of wine. I need you to do something. And he says, look, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What What is the hour Jesus is talking about? He's talking about his crucifixion, his death and his resurrection. That's what he came. In other words, Jesus was in a sense saying to Mary, look, I did not come to save parties. I came to save people. I came to save people. But Mary kind of pushes, and she turns, and in verse 5, she turns to the servants that are at the wedding, and she says, do whatever he tells you to do. Do whatever he tells you to do. That word whatever is a big one, because whatever is whatever. 
right? There's no, gar- there's no limits to whatever. And, and that's the posture of our heart as Christ followers is that we are called to do whatever God calls us to do. And so she says this to the servants. Now, I want to stop for just a minute because this is where the Lord gripped my heart is that when I was reading the story, I, I began to look at the servants and think, oh, gosh, I never noticed the servants before. And, and when you look at a story like this and when you're reading the Bible, by the way, be looking for things like this. Be looking for details like who's in this story. Well, Jesus is in the story. His disciples are in the story. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is in the story. Um, there's a master of the banquet who's in the story. There's a bride and a bridegroom. There are wedding guests. There are lots and lots of characters in this story. But had anybody ever thought about the servants? I hadn't. I hadn't. And it's the servants who are going to play the biggest role other than Jesus in this story. And they seem very insignificant, and they're the lowliest of the low, and they're there not as friends, they're there as workers, and yet they're the ones that are going to be invited to be part of the miracle that God is doing. And it was in that moment that the Lord began to work in my heart and say, Kelly, I brought you to Nashville, Tennessee, not to be a star, but to be a servant. And that was over 20 years ago, and God has been working that out in my heart ever since, and I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes why that has been so life-changing for me. Well, we see that there are these six stone water jars that are set aside for Jewish purification, and Jesus tells the servants, go fill those jars with water. Now, here's the problem. In this, at this point in the story, the, the, the wedding is not out of water. The wedding is out of what? Give it to me. The wedding is out of? Wine, yes. The wedding's out of wine. And so Jesus is asking them to do something that seems incredibly, exceedingly foolish. That they're going to go fill up these six stone jars with water. And it says, though, that they did it. They filled the jars to the brim. And I have that underlined in my Bible, to the brim. Because I don't know if you've experienced this, but when the Lord calls you to obedience, I don't know how you are. But when the Lord calls me to take a step of obedience, a lot of times what I like to do is I like to do like a 90-10. Like I'll 90% obey, and if I can hold back 10%, just in case this doesn't go the way I hope, just in case this goes off the rails, just in case God's withholding from me, I want to keep a little bit back. But in this moment, I want you to see that the servants didn't just do a little, they didn't do just half, and this was a big deal. Because this is a foolish errand at this point as far as the world's eyes are concerned. But it says that they filled the jars to the brim. And I want to ask you this morning, what are you holding back? What have you not totally put in the jar? I think it's easy for us, especially even at a Christian university, to say, oh, Lord, but I'm taking the classes. I'm at a Christian school. I'm, I'm at chapel every week. I'm going to have to be here. But I'm at chapel every week and all these things. But... But then if I can just keep this 15% or this 20% back or this 5% back. But the Lord is asking for total obedience. So it says that they, they filled it to the brim. And then this is where it gets really risky. Jesus says, now I want you to draw some out and take it to the head waiter. Now here's the thing. He doesn't say draw wine out. He says, I want you to draw some out. Well, they put water in. What are they going to get out? They're going to get water. So they filled these water jars to the brim. Now they're going to take water out and they're going to take this water to the master of the banquet. And this is not something that could have just <clears throat> cost them something. This could have cost them their jobs. The master of the banquet is desperately looking for wine. He's not looking for more water. But Jesus says, I want you to, to take water or take what you uh, pour out uh, or draw out to the head waiter. And it says that they did. They obeyed fully. And then, <clears throat> I'm sure you saw it in verse 9. It says, when the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. So we see that someplace in the middle of obedience, water 
is turned into wine by the time that it gets to the master of the banquet. <clears throat> I want to pause in the story just a minute. Um, I've been in Nashville almost 24 years. Like I said, I grew up in the Northern Virginia area. <clears throat> I am, um, my dad is a pastor. He started a church a couple years before I was born in Reston, Virginia, right outside the city. And I was there almost 50 years. And when I was 25, I moved to Nashville because I signed a record deal. And I was, like I said, I was so excited. I was so pumped. I'd worked so hard. I was ready to go. I got to Nashville within six months of me signing that record deal. Uh, the, the company was bought out by uh, a now very um, ancient company called AOL, Time Warner. But they bought out the record company and then they dropped uh, all their new artists. And so within six months of being in Nashville, I was without a record deal. So I signed another record deal a few months later and had some radio success and was really happy about that and was super excited. And right as I was having radio success, my uh, record company went bankrupt. Then I signed uh, with a booking agent who got put in jail. It was like the worst possible thing. And it just got, kept getting worse and worse. And I remember calling home one day and I was like, Dad, I just don't understand what's happening. I mean, I came here. I've been here for a few years now. It's just been struggle. It's been hard. I said, a lot of my friends are having all this success. They're, you know, their songs are going great. They're going up to the top. And my dad said, here's the thing, Kelly. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for them. And I want you to pray that God continues to bless them because that will keep you from having a bitter heart and, and from, from being jealous. And, and, and I was like, dad, is mom there? Because I would rather talk to her right now. And so anyway, my mom gets on the phone, we talk through all this stuff. I mean, it was good advice, but you know, I just wasn't really ready to hear that. And so I kept going. And then I signed a third record deal out of London. And they had a partnership with Nashville. And they, they produced and published incredible worship songs like In Christ Alone and 10,000 Reasons and Here I Am to Worship and Blessed Be Your Name. And, and I thought, this is amazing. After all these years of struggling, after all these years of struggling, finally, Third time's a charm, like God's gonna do it. But I, the thing is, is that third time's a charm is not in the Bible. It feels like it should be in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Sadly, there's not, it's not a proverb. We just made it up. And so it, I signed with that record company and I remember the record company president, a man by the name of John Pack. He called me one day and he said, hey, I know we just signed you. I know you're brand new to the label, but we're gonna be doing a worship night at Abbey Road Studios in London where the Beatles recorded all of their records. And we want you to come and we want you to rehearse with the band and we want you to be part of this worship night with all these legacy worship leaders. And I was like, yes, finally, after all these years, like struggling, here we go. So I went to London, did that night. It was amazing. It was amazing, epic, epic experience. Uh, got to stay there a week, got to rehearse every day. They had a private chef that made us, I mean, it was amazing. And after, the, uh, after I had performed, I went up and I sat in the balcony and watch some other people lead worship. And then, and then the record company head, John Pat, got up and he said, hey, you guys, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for uh, being part of this live recording. Uh, but before everybody goes, I wanna show you a video. I wanna show you a video about a ministry that I've been involved in called Justice and Mercy International in the Amazon jungle of Brazil. And he shows this video. And here I am in London, Abbey Road Studios, and I'm watching this video and everybody looks really hot in the video. Uh, they're on like open air hammock boats. They look uncomfortable. It's very jungly. And I remember having a distinct thought, like I am so glad God has called me to London and he has called those people to the Amazon jungle. Praise the Lord. And about Five minutes later, after the night was over, John walked up to me and he said, Kelly, I've been thinking, have you ever wanted to come to the Amazon jungle? Would you ever want to come to the Amazon jungle with me? And I was like, John, you know what? No. No, I like London. I like this whole gig. And I said, no, actually, I would like to go to the Amazon. That sounds like something that everybody should check off their list. Like just a box you want to check that you went to the Amazon jungle on a boat and did that. So, um, actually, one of my best friends is here today with me, Mary Catherine Hunt. She's the CEO of Justice and Mercy International, and she went before me, and then I went that following year, and uh, brought my dad, brought my siblings. Uh, eventually, my mom came multiple times, but she hates cockroaches, so she's out. But I got down there, and God completely changed my life, completely changed my life. I went the next year, completely changed my life. 
Um, you know, what Pastor Jacob was talking about, about what you do with your summers, oh, let me tell you. If God's, if God's calling you, go do it. Go do it. Got uh, there the second time, jungle pastors, indigenous jungle pastors, some without electricity, some without clean water, some with one or two shirts to their name. We're coming out of the woodwork because they heard a, a pastor, my dad from America was there, and, and we didn't even know how they found out. And they were just pulling up in canoes, and he's helping train them under trees. And it was, it was, it was crazy. And then we decided, we thought, you know what would be good here is that it would be really important to maybe start a jungle pastors conference. We can train these men and women, train them because they, they've got the heart and they've got the zeal and they're, they're, they're sacrificing it, but they just don't have a lot of Bible knowledge because they haven't had the training that you guys are getting here and that I'm getting in seminary currently. And so we're like, we can, we can help bring that. And so we had our first annual jungle pastors conference and it wrecked me. It wrecked me. I sat, I sat with a man named Pastor Naum. He had broken Portuguese. And I had a translator sitting there and I was asking about his life and he had the, just the, his face was so joyful. He was so excited to tell me what God was doing. And he said, you know, I live in the city of Manaus and it, it, it takes 20 hay eyes for me to fill up my canoe and get two hours away to a village and then 20 hay eyes to get back. And he said, but God did the most amazing thing recently. I can't wait to tell you about it. He said, God provided me with a job that pays 40 hay eyes a week so I can fill up my canoe with gasoline so I can go preach the gospel every weekend. And he said, and you know what the job is? He said, I'm so excited. He said, it is cleaning toilets at a gas station. And I remember somewhere in the middle of this interview, the, the, the translator turned to me and she said, I'm, she said, I just want you to understand this is a, this is a very uneducated, this is a simple man because she, she, she was having a hard time sometimes understanding some of the things that he was saying. And when we got to that point, I thought, oh, Lord Jesus, let me be a simple woman if it means that kind of education in Jesus Christ. It was, it was so moving for me. And I remember just being wrecked by these men and women. And so we, we kept having more Jungle Pastors conferences. And then we had, like, we were like at the eighth annual Jungle Pastors Conference, and now we have three a year, over 120 men and women coming to these conferences every year. And I remember one time I had the women, these wives, they're incredible. I mean, you want to talk about, like, amazing women. Like, these women come, like, these ladies spear fish for dinner. Like, throw a spear into the water and, and spear fish and then cook it up. I mean, they are bosses. It's amazing. And I remember sitting with them and, te and teaching them, and they're teaching me more than I'm able to teach them. And finally, one of them asked, they say, how did you get here? And I thought, how did I get here? I'm in the middle of the jungle. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I actually know where the middle of nowhere is. I have been to it. It's in the jungle. And I thought, how did I get here? And as I began to recount the story, it was almost like I was reliving it for the first time in hindsight. And I said, well, guys, how I got here was that I had these big dreams that God was going to lift me up. And then I was going to do great and mighty things. And then I was going to have money and I was going to have notoriety and people, I was going to have friends and I was going to be invited to important places. And I was going to be esteemed and I was going to have worth and all the things that I could put my hand to. That was the plan. I was like, but the Lord, he didn't, he didn't let that plan come to fruition. In fact, he really broke that plan down. Um, I wrote a Bible study kind of all about this, about modern day idolatry, because anything can be an idol in our life. And for me, it was music. And it was being a singer-songwriter. And it was being famous. And it was having good friends. It was, I had a lot of them. And the Lord, bit by bit, began to tear those idols down. Praise God. If God is tearing some idols down in your life today, I just want to affirm today, it's not because he's mad. It's not because um, he's trying to ruin your life. It's because he loves you that much. He loves you that much. He wants to give you himself. There's no greater reward on the planet that's greater than the reward of Jesus Christ himself. 
And so God had thwarted my plans. And so I was explaining to them like, man, God had thwarted my plans. And then I finally signed this record deal. And I'm talking to these jungle women. And I'm like, I'd I'd sign this record deal. And I was going to be rich and famous. And I was like, and somehow I got here. And I, and I told them, I said, you know, it was interesting. It's just like a year before I was sitting out on the boat and I was sitting on the boat with the record company president, John Pack. And the sun had set and I could see fires crackling in the distance, the villages, people closing up for the night. And I remember sitting there and I remember realizing that John, as powerful as he was in the music business, I realized that we didn't really talk about music anymore because my record didn't do anything again. <clears throat> And all we were talking about was the jungle and what God was doing in the jungle. And I realized in that moment that God had tricked me to the Amazon by taking me to London first through a record deal. And I was so glad. And I talked to those women and I was telling them the story and I said, I thought I was going this way, but the Lord wanted me here. And I said, you know, guys, when I was dreaming my dreams of all the things that I wanted to do with my life, I can tell you this, the eighth annual Jungle Pastors Conference was not on that list. But I looked at those women, tears in my eyes, tears in their eyes. I said, I wouldn't trade this for anything in the world. Sometimes God gives us the desires that we don't even know we're looking for. When it says in the Old Testament that God gives us the desires of our hearts, sometimes that means, I think, that he actually gives us the the, the, what we are desiring. But sometimes I think he actually plants desires in our hearts, desires that you may not even have right now. And I can tell you the Amazon wasn't a desire in my heart. But I've gone well over 30 times. My heart's so wrapped up in that place. I love it. It's changed my life. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But I didn't get there through stardom. I got there through brokenness. I got, if you want to be truthful, I kind of got there through failure. I had time to go to the Amazon. You get what I'm saying? Nobody, like the Grammys weren't calling. I had time. That was free. I could go. And so the Lord did a great work in my life. In our text, when those servants brought that water, they thought they were carrying water. Don't know when it turned to wine. I don't know if you've read this story before, but I always thought, I just kind of assumed that Jesus said, all right, listen up, everybody come around. Uh, See these stone jars that have been filled with water? I'm going to do a little magic, and this is going to turn into wine. And you're going to see how powerful I am. That is not how this goes. These servants took water out of those jars, and they walked water to the head waiter, and somewhere in the middle of their obedience, God did a miracle. Because it says the master of the banquet drew from there, drank the wine that had come from the water. And the master of the banquet goes, this is incredible. Normally we save, we put, we save, we put the best out first but you guys have saved the best for the last. And so then he begins to, to, you know, compliment the bridegroom like, well done, wow, way to go, way to pull out the finest wine at the end. And it says something very, very important. In verse nine, it says that master of the banquet did not know where the wine had come from. Here's the important part. But the servants who had drawn the water new. The servants who had drawn the water knew. They weren't confused. You got a master of the banquet, you have a bride, you have a bridegroom, you have guests, you have disciples, you have all kinds of people, you marry, you got all these people there. And it's the servants who knew the secret. The servants were the only ones that got to be part of the miracle In fact, I can pretty much guarantee you they never even got to taste the wine. They didn't get to taste the miracle. They got to be part of the miracle. And here's the thing. They didn't have to taste it because they had met the source of the wine. They had met the source of life. And it was in that moment as I was going through this text all those years ago, pre-Amazon, pre-many things, 
that the Lord said, Kelly, here's what I'm asking. Be a servant. Be my servant. Do the things, the normal things, the daily things. Put water in. Take water out. Serve. Follow me. Do it to the brim. Do it when it's risky. Do it when it doesn't make sense. And watch what I'm going to do. Watch me do miracles. Watch me take the mundane obedience and watch me blow you away. And it's been a journey. It's been a journey. But it was the servants who know the secret, and that's what I want to be. And I want to encourage you. The Lord has called us to lay our life down. I'm in seminary right now, and so you guys can have mercy on me. I, had to, I was four and a half hours on my plane yesterday in Calvin's Institutes. You guys sad for me right now? You should be. Uh, no, it was great. But he said the sum of the Christian life is self-denial. We're to, get, we're, to, we're to lay our dreams down so that God can do what he wants to do in our life. And I can tell you there's not a better dream than letting God do what he wants to do with your life. And this is the time. This is the day. Today can be a marker. October 15th can be a marker on your calendar that this is the day that you said, Lord, I give you my life. If you're not a follower of Jesus, but you're thinking about it or you're wondering about it, I just want to close by saying that these six stone water jars that were there for Jewish purification, that represented the old Jewish law and custom. That, re that represented <clears throat> the old religious system. It, it represented how people used to get purified. And so I just want you to hear me today that Jesus was not just saving a party. He was not just showing his power that, oh, wow, look at I can take water and I can make it into wine, as cool as that is. Jesus was overturning the old religious system, and he was filling it with the wine of himself. What does that mean for you and I today? It means that there was a day before Jesus came that we were trying to do things on our own. We were trying to do the right thing. We were trying to deal with our guilt and our shame through a whole lot of religious system and, and all, all kinds of hoops that we had to jump through. And it wasn't bad, but it was limited in what it could do, the law was. And Jesus has come. This story is not about him saving a party. The story is about him bringing life. He's taking an old religious system and he's bringing grace. He's taking mundane water and he's bringing wine. And I want you to hear this today, that if you have come in with guilt or if you have come in with shame, or if there are addictions in your life or behaviors or habits and there are things that you're trying to deal with and you've been trying to deal with it on your own, but you cannot, and it's just water in and water out, and you haven't come to Jesus, he wants to give you new life. He wants to renew you. He wants to take up residence in your heart. He wants to be present with you. He wants to walk this whole life with you. And he wants to give you a future and a hope. That's the point of the story because the story didn't end here. Eventually Jesus gets to the hour that he came for, which was for his death and his resurrection, to pay for my sin and your sin so that we might become the righteousness of God and so that we could live the adventurous life in him. Father, thank you. God, I pray a blessing on every single person that is here today. God, cover them with your favor. Lord, I pray that distractions would not come in, but Lord, those who need to do business with you, Lord, would do it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so, so much.